Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. It's been a very, very long time. My hiatus is hopefully over now. I'm working on a big video project, but in the meantime, at least I can go back to the podcast, which is some sort of content. Um, this is episode number eight, and today I'm joined by Benedict the Seventeenth. He is a YouTuber who is both a liberalist and a uh, ardent Catholic, which I find very, very interesting. And I think we can have an interesting conversation about the intersection of those. His channel is very excellent. I highly re recommend it and his videos. He's very thoughtful and among those promoting, I think, what people what people like Sargon will call liberalism or liberalist ideology, his are probably some of the best arguments I've actually heard for it. So Benedict, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. And uh, like you said, I'm Roman Catholic. I'm a, a former seminarian and a graduate in philosophy. I advocate for classical liberal principles in politics, and I've been uh, involved with the liberalists since early January. Hmm. And I'm the president of the nonprofit organization, USA Liberalists. And okay, interesting. So how did you actually come to both uh, believe in classical liberalism and then, I suppose, become more active in it as a um, entity with the liberalists? Sure. So I would say that for me, it was uh, junior, uh, well, my first junior year of college, I took a political philosophy class and it happened to be with the philosopher Douglas Rasmussen. Mm -hmm. uh, Douglas Rasmussen, for those who don't know, is a key figure in kind of uh, current liberal thought. Uh, he identifies himself as a classical liberal, though I would say that he's a, kind of on the far side, uh, kind of libertarian almost towards uh, anarcho-capitalism. But um, I found his arguments for liberalism in general very compelling. Um, and though I don't follow him all the way, I, uh, I adopted his kind of uh, structure of liberalism as derived from Aristotelian uh, thought. Hmm. And I think that's, oh, uh, yeah. And how did you come to um, be part of the liberalists? What was the process of doing that, uh, of getting into, I suppose, Sargon's movement? Yeah, sure. So um, you know, while I was in seminary, I, I started watching more YouTube videos. Not sure why, but, um, you know, betw between college and moving to seminary, I became more aware of kind of the political uh, sphere on YouTube, and uh, I became aware of the term alt-right. I think I heard it first because of uh, Milo Yiannopoulos and news about him, and I found uh, the idea of the alt-right. Now, you have to understand at this time, the alt-right and the alt-light weren't all that distinct, so I wasn't aware that it was as ethno-nationalist as it is today. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, yeah, I was interested in the... Um, in the rise of the alt-right because I think it mirrored kind of the rise of kind of the new traditionalism in the, uh, in Catholic circles, you know, the, uh, the return of the TLM, uh, stuff like that. So, so I was interested in this thing and, uh, I decided to look up the alt-right, uh, through YouTube. And the first, the first video I found was Sargon's analysis of the alt-right, uh, which was thorough enough and, I enjoyed Sargon. Uh, that's how I learned about Sargon, basically, and I kept watching his videos through that. Uh, and so while I agreed and disagreed with Sargon on various things, uh, when he made that video kind of announcing the liberalists, I was like, hey, this is an, this is an interesting project. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as I know, it's kind of the first, first serious attempt of a YouTuber to start something new on the ground. Um, and, you know, and as, as I was a classical liberal, I, I was like, well, I might not agree on Sargon on, on everything, but at least on uh, the seven principles he has laid out, I think there's some common ground there. Mm -hmm. So I kind of followed that for a while. I joined the Facebook group. And then a few weeks into it, I was like, uh, I made a post saying, you know, this is great that we've had this uh, Facebook group that people are doing stuff online, but the whole point about this was to get stuff going in the real world, uh, on the ground. And, uh, and kind of the response I got was, yeah, we should do that. Uh, how are we going to do it? And I said, well, if I think it would help if we made kind of country chapters or regional chapters. Uh, so people in local areas can actually plan a, 
as to what to do on the ground. And uh, from that, different regional groups for the liberalists were created, and I created the USA Liberalists. Hmm. And so what is the, sort of the response, or have you been in contact with Sargon or any of the other, I suppose, more higher-ups or people that helped organize the movement? Uh, I've had a few brief um, brief conversations with Sargon, nothing too in-depth. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the YouTubers who perhaps helped popularize the term liberalist haven't really been involved in the organizing process. Uh, in, ma in many ways, the, uh, the organization has kind of outgrown uh, the kind of skeptic YouTube uh, circle in which it uh, originated. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I asked that because I'm quite interested, I think, naturally, that you being a Catholic itself or being a religious person in a sphere that was in a movement that was founded by people that are more or less acolytes of the new atheists who obviously are quite hostile to religion. I mean, you have Sargon uh, infamously, I think now at the uh, US inauguration sort of getting triggered and freaking out when they were gonna have a prayer and muting it so that you couldn't listen because you just did not want to hear a prayer or him saying, I remember explicitly remember in one episode of This Week in Stupid, he basically said, yeah, I'd like to shut down all the religious schools in Britain that for me, I would just be very hesitant to trust the people like that as leaders. But if you're saying that they're not really the leaders of the liberalist movement, I think that's more interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think the way I would describe it is, you know, they do a lot for the PR, for the advertising, um, in the sense that, you know, people watch their videos and they talk about liberalism and classical liberal principles. Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're very helpful. Um, I would, but there's a difference between doing that and actually, you know, organizing meetings, talking about stuff, trying to set up events, mm -hmm. um, kind of all that legwork, uh, as well as trying, you know, trying to, you know, trying to deal with conflicts within the group, um, you know, be, you know, how to deal with hot button issues, uh, you know, stuff like abortion, for example. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think. Um, I'm hearing an echo on your side, sorry. Are you wearing headphones? All right, I'm how... not. Okay, uh, could you put on a pair of headphones? Do you have any? Yeah, let me see if I can... I, I was looking for them earlier. All right, thanks. If you can't find them, I think it's okay. You can just mute yourself when I talk so we don't have to hear an echo. Sorry about that. No problem. I, I was always talk, saying that to the chat. But in the um, in the meantime, I, I hopefully if you're listening, are you still listening? Or I am, yeah. Okay, good. So I think uh, while you're looking, I can just sort of express why I think it's actually quite interesting that both of us are pretty much within a year of each other um, in age, uh, both Catholics. Me, a convert. You, I, I don't know uh, background of, but we've almost sort of come to completely opposite conclusions on uh, the to the topic of, of liberalism pretty much around the same age in college or for you seminary uh, or no college that I've actually come to the conclusion that as an ardent opponent of liberalism, not necessarily for me, it's not necessarily the philosophy or the arguments behind it, but for me, it's looking at history and what I think the huge amount of damage it's done to Western civilization pr primarily by what I think of the sort of imperialist or liberal crusades done by Western democracies like Britain and France and the United States in conflicts like World War One and Two, um, the you know one of my sort of the, the icon of my channel before that I interchange with this mongoose is Kaiser Wilhelm, and I think just considering the massive amount of uh, I think unnecessary casualties that were inflicted upon innocent people both on both sides by the classical liberal democracies of Britain, France, and the United States on countries like Germany and Austria were, you know, sort of show a very, very ugly side of liberalism, where essentially it's, if you don't adhere to our political beliefs, we will starve out as many people as we can until you have a revolution. Hello? Yeah, I'm, no, I'm still here. I'm, I'm kind of... Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm not hearing, a, I'm not hearing an echo anymore, so that's good. Okay. 
So that was just sort of a pause that I was uh, giving to you on that, that I don't necessarily think that liberalism itself is an idea. It, I think there's a lot of, or at least for my, I think of it more as um, a descriptive uh, term that, you know, for societies, say, like the United States in the early 19th century or Britain in the 18th century, that the conditions were ripe for something like liberalism or liberal society to exist. I don't think it's those conditions exist now. And I think that the ideology that that ideology has been taken to do a huge amount of damage and hurt a lot of innocent people over the years. I'm just wondering how you'd yeah. respond to that. Yeah, no, I'm thinking about it. Um, well, that's something I, most people don't do, is think. <laughs> Anyways, go. I yeah, well, well, I guess my first response is that I think I think you're right um, in the sense that countries that have adopted the label liberal, whether they they were or not, um, have inflicted a lot of damage um, in many ways. Uh, we might sit, you know, we might ask whether that damage was because of their liberalism or in spite of it. But it doesn't it doesn't change the fact that uh, a lot of liberal countries have you know, inflicted what we might call violence uh, on their own peoples and other peoples. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking for me, it's specifically the fact that it's really just the sort of savagery, I almost think, or, I mean, history is written by the victors and the idea that, you know, the thing I learned, because if your background's in philosophy, mine is in history, uh, the idea that there's ever a moral, a really, a truly moral side that's good or versus evil in a war has never really existed. I believe in moral objectivism. I just don't believe that you can say one side of any war is good or evil, considering, you know, yeah, stopping the Holocaust is a good thing, but you also have the, you know, ethnic cleansing of Germans uh, in Eastern Germany by the Soviets and the bombing of, you know, Hiroshima and the, you know, firebombing of Hamburg. I'm just, I think though, on a, but my previous point, what I'm actually more interested in is the, my claim that I don't think that the conditions in the West right now are conducive towards a liberal society because we have lost not just uh, Christian, I think you would agree that Christianity is um, intrinsically tied to uh, liberalism, that we don't really live in a society that is conducive to liberalism anymore. I'm wondering how you respond to that. I think th I th I think there there is some truth to that. Uh, we certainly don't have the same the same homogeny that perhaps we did um, when liberalism first arose, and when liberalism, you know, perhaps the conditions were more right for liberalism. But mm -hmm. I guess the way I see it is that. Liberalism is, in many ways, a moral objective. It is, it is something we strive for, and we recognize that uh, there have been failures along the way, and perhaps, uh, perhaps there are going to be more failures. Um, you know, and those failures aren't something to look forward to, but you know, it's a reality that when we strive for a certain moral objective, uh, that we are going to fail because we are imperfect creatures. Mm -hmm. And I think. Uh, where I suppose our primarily par primary disagreement is, sorry, it's been a while since I streamed, is that you know, is believing in uh, these things as the objective moral end. Because for the, I suppose, ideology or movement I'm trying to be part of is the way I would describe, say, traditionalism or the reactionary ideology I f uh, follow would be that if liberalism holds, because I, I don't know if you would disagree with this a definition. My definition of liberalism is the ideology that believes that upholds uh, individual rights as the highest moral value. For me, I uphold. I try and argue that I uphold. The, I consider the idea of morality itself, the true good and the beautiful, to be the highest value, and that as a byproduct of that, you will get relatively higher degrees of individual liberty. But that the liberty itself. I, I remember watching in a video. Uh, I think your response to the distributist can, showing how um, liberalism, a free society, is a byproduct of Christianity. In a, if you look at it through, if like uh, God or is um, acting through a prism, one of its 
results or one of the um, colors would be liberalism. But I'm thinking it seems like you're then only running away with one of those uh, aspects as opposed to trying to focus on where that comes from. Sure. Um, what, I, what I would say is that li a liberal do isn't someone who believes that individual rights are the highest moral value. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm not sure you could really say an individual rights are a moral value. They are the highest political value. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I mean, I think that's, uh, for me, there's not really all that much of a distinction considering it's, uh, because politics is supposed to be the expression of sort of what you want to achieve in a society, right? Not exactly. Um, you, well, there are certain people who believe that. Uh, but you know, that is a claim that is a claim in itself that would require its own justification that the goal of politics is to achieve a certain end in society. Mm -hmm. What do you believe the goal of politics is? The goal of politics isn't necessarily to achieve a certain end of society, I, I would say, but, but to allow for the necessary conditions for, um, a given end or set of possible ends. Um, so maybe not the driving force itself, but the inf an influence or a way to allow that to happen. Right. Politics isn't meant to achieve the common good, but to achieve the necessary conditions for it. Though I would think, uh, I'm thinking right now that I think anybody that would subscribe to fascism or a number of auto authoritarian or totalitarian ideologies would actually say the opposite, that it is the goal of the state to strive for that moral end, or perhaps they would say the moral end is the state itself. Right, that would be a, that would be a distinction between li uh, liberalism and uh, totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I guess fun uh, fundamentally, why I made that distinction between political value and moral value is because the, I believe there are higher ends uh, for human beings. Um, ultimately, ultimately, I believe that a human a human being's life is ordered towards the love and service of God. Um, and the states, and the states certainly should have the conditions necessary, uh, to achieve that. I'm just, I'm just not convinced that it's the role of the state, um, to coerce people into, into living that out. And I'm not sure whether it's possible for the state to do so. I mean, and for my view is that, um, my view is that we all... The state has to have some form of we unless you're an anarchist, you sort of believe that coercion is acceptable in certain cases, right? Sure. That does if people should be coerced so that they cannot kill each other. That's why murder is illegal and there are consequences to actions. I'm thinking that you know, you mentioned Thomas Hobbes, and I'm thinking that I, I almost think that how should I put it is that I the belief that human beings are not sort of inherently good or are not going to act. I know that makes it sound so simplistic, but uh, sort of trying to put that, I don't agree with the sort of premises of John Locke or Rousseau that sort of, and especially the Rousseauian idea that mankind is born free, but everywhere he's in chains. I just find sort of the mass emphasis on liberty to be almost vexing for me of why is it so important? Well, I think it's important because it is, it is central to human nature. I mean, when we look at what separates us, um, you know, from the animals, uh, I mean, what it means to be a human being is to be a rational animal. Um, mm -hmm. And re reason is what allows us to make choices. And choices is, frank frankly, what, what we talk about when we mean by freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, you could say humans are choice-making creatures. Or as Plato said, a uh, a uh, what is it, a featherless biped. <laughs> exactly. So of course the funny story of that is uh, Diogenes the cynic then just plucked all the feathers off of a chicken and threw I think ran into the academy and told Plato, hey look a human. <laughs> but uh, on that is <clears throat> I think it can sort of uh, boil down to just sort of fundamental disagreement on. Again, as I as I pointed out, or I said, is that I don't think empiric. I looking me looking empirically, don't really see uh, societies based on liberalism as having been all that successful. That say externally, I sort of mentioned the 
bad things that a lot of liberal societies have done, but it's internally is I'm, I think that the sort of consumerist, I completely self-absorbed culture we live in is a largely, if not a direct result, but certainly not helped by the under the uh, overall values of liberalism, that the idea that human being allowing the individual to have maximum freedom possible it's sort of like this idea that okay you're telling you can if it's going to tell people if liberalism says to people find your own happiness or it says you're free to live your life the way you want people want some sort of structure they want some sort of authorities to tell them to guide them into what they're supposed to do with their lives i think it's sort of um what I, why I think the sort of Gamergate, new atheist skeptics are failing is because young people now, they want, and why they're drifting to people like Jordan Peterson is they want somebody, they want some almost sort of paternal figure to tell them what to do, not force them, but to give them some sort of guidance. And if you have the ideology that boils down to, as I think the skeptics, the skeptics seem to think that uh, liberal, what liberalism means, is you can do whatever you want because there's no such thing as morality. Uh, the most, the highest, or the most, the closest thing to morality is to make sure you don't quote unquote hurt anybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I I would think that would be. I mean, I I would think that anyone who has that moral view, um, I mean that that's kind of a very simplistic moral view and one mm -hmm. and one that raises a lot of questions. Um, does someone who doesn't hurt anyone else but fails to make anyone's life better, um, would we say that's a moral moral person, a good person, someone who's lived a good human life? I don't think so, um, and I and I don't think any uh, uh, any of the liberalists do. Uh, what I think is what I think is tough is that uh, it's it's the confusion between the political order and the moral order, um, and I think. And I, and I think that, you know, that confusion does exist, especially perhaps among the, the YouTube li liberalist community. There, there is this feeling of, well, if it's not illegal, it's, it's not wrong. Um, and, and what I think our role as, as uh, faithful Christians is to say, no, we're not going to make everything, we're not going to make everything that's wrong illegal. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not wrong. Hmm. Same thing. It's almost like having that backwards where it's no uh, law is not, you know, just the law is not does not prescribe what is moral or immoral. It's supposed to reflect that, you know, uh, murder isn't wrong because the law says it is. It's the law says it is because it's immoral. But I think we don't really disagree on that. And that's why I actually think it's interesting as to why we sort of came to these different conclusions, despite probably on most issues, we would very strongly agree, both pro-life, pro-traditional pro family, because the, the bigger uh, sort of question I have, um, because I, I feel like I want to get out of just rambling, is that, <clears throat> you know, I, I actually sincerely applaud people, you know, people like Sargon or you trying to uphold something that is not just a, well, we don't believe in anything, we're not a group, we're not an ideology, to actually say, no, we do have principles we're going to stand for, or stand up for, and believe in, but it's that I think there's a substantial number of problems that surround the, I would say, anybody that wants to create a liberal project because the pushback is going to come from the people that think that have been raised for years now that think to think that actual liberalism is something that comes from the new atheists or and the skeptics to say it's not about um, that, you know, our rights don't come from God or they don't, there is no sort of objective higher moral truths that it's all about essentially having the right to smoke weed, play video games, and masturbate. Because mm -hmm. that's honestly what a lot... And I think that, to me, would be the challenge before anybody that wants to uh, promote liberalism today is to try and understand that, offer people that... Explain to people that lib that freedom has to come with a set of duties. That's uh, You can't just have license to do whatever you want. Maybe legally, you can do a lot. But people don't really... Um, but I think just trying to say more free speech, more free speech, more free speech, I think moral direction towards something better, towards a good life, is more important than just trying to emphasize, you know, freedom. I don't think, I don't think you would disagree with that, would you? No, I don't think I do. I think, um, I guess I think my perspective is that 
if that's the case, if if we find if we find that liberal groups, liberal institutions are overrun by new atheist types, like you know, like the Sam Harris's, the um, the Dawkins, uh, the Dawkins of the world, um, in a sense, it's it there there is kind of an almost evangelical task um, Christians have to take and to say, no, liberal liberalism isn't doesn't require these things there 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 is another another way and perhaps a better way of of defending the liberal project mm -hmm. and, and i mean i think also for me is or it's something that i'm writing my upcoming video uh call it's going to be called and the reason i did not upload it today instead of having this i uh, conversation is that it's called a conservatives deserve better than conservatism and it's the fact that I think the conservative movement in America, which is in large part, is liberal, is liberal. You know, um, America, American conservatives are based on the founding fathers' classical liberalism at its core, has been more or less since the end of World War II an utter and utter. Sorry, you failure. cut out. Oh, I'm sorry. I was saying um, my next video that's coming up on conservatism and why I think it is utterly and catastrophically failed is that. I think it's it's failed to achieve any of its goals that it or any of its uh, aims since the end of World War II. I think because it doesn't have classical liberalism does not have a adequate response to progressivism. That you know, for decades the classical liberals in the form of American conservatives have not been able to resist the progressive takeover of the institutions. And I think at this point, when they run pretty much every major institution in society, that different tactics or a whole different strategy is needed if there's going to be any movement that's going to successfully resist the progressives. And I just don't think liberalism is able to do it. Well, it's, it's tough to say because in many ways, uh, there is kind of a loss of what, um, what it means to be, you know, a true classical liberal. Um, like you said, it's it's devolved into almost this libertarian, almost anarcho-capitalism. I would almost say more like hedonism for a yeah. lot of people. I mean, there there is that there, um, you know, and I think that's that's why uh, Sargon chose uh, liberalist as as a new new name as opposed to uh, kind of liberal. Yeah, moving everyone into liberal or libertarian. There needed to be this kind of re refounding, reorienting of the, of the liberal project. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that, unfortunately, it's in, if it's under the leadership of Sargon, which, again, if you said it's not, like I would vastly be happier if somebody like you was in charge of the liberalist project because at least you, people like you and religious liberals, like, say, Stephen Crowder, Ben Shapiro, or Dennis Prager, understand there is some actual need for metaphysics some need for spirituality if you're going to have if you want to justify your movement philosophically because as uh, if you delve into just pure materialism scientific materialism you end up with the um, Stephen Hawking idea that philosophy is dead but I still have to maintain that even politically like I agree with you that there there should be uh, an ought to be a distinction between now I don't think it's uh, maybe we can agree or disagree on whether or not it's as wide or narrow um, between morality and pol politics, but I even politically I don't really understand the need to uphold liberty as the highest value. For me, something more along the lines of order and morality itself would be my uh, would be my highest value, my highest ideal politically. Yeah, well. You know, to touch on what you said, I I, I do want to mention that I th I I don't think we've had kind of an official survey of what the um what the religious beliefs of the leadership and active members of the liberalists are. Um, my guess would be is perhaps the largest minority would be atheist. Uh, but there uh but there's also probably an equal number of Catholics and uh, Protestants. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, other religions being being minority rep representations. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking. I forgot what I was just gonna, what I just said, but yeah. Oh yeah, I said the fact that 
you know, I, I've just never seen really the reason or the thing that sort of my philosophical or I would say more political awakening in college was just sort of this idea that I don't that I almost felt sort of liberated when I thought, you know, maybe I don't actually need to think about things in along the lines of liberty versus tyranny, that there's more to politics, there's more to politics than um, just that, that, you know, especially looking at history where, where, and I don't think, I mean, I will, you'll probably disagree with me, but I don't really think that liberalism in any form that we could recognize or the founding fathers could recognize existed at all in the middle ages. And I don't, th and unlike I would say the atheists or the enlightenment thinkers that were using that as a way to smear the middle ages, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Well, I get, I, I guess what I would say is that the reason why freedom is held up, held up as this value is that it, it is what separates us, um, you know, from other animals. It's it's what's central to human nature. I mean, I think partially, but I, I don't think that that's, I think the problem is then uh, we're taking, the, or the end people take that to where it is, the highest goal is for mankind to be, for the individual to be as free as possible. Because I think certainly there's, humanity was meant to worship God. That is our highest goal ultimately, is to be reconciled to God uh, as us as beings made in his image. And I think almost that's what I would, instead of saying that it's what differentiates us from the animals, I would say, for me, what differentiates us from the animals primarily is the fact that we are made in the image of God. Right, but what, what does it mean to say that we are made in the image of God? Um, for me, it says means we share in a divine sacred. We, there is something divine, some sort of almost divine spark uh, present in humanity. There is something holy about us. Sure, but at at that question, what does it mean? You know, what does it, what does it mean that we have a divine spark? Um, hmm. I'm just wondering because actually, I'm more asking you the, the question here: is of why do you think that leads towards uh, humanity being sort of uh, animal describing us as sort of liberty being integral to human nature, that being the primary thing uh, as it relates to us being made in God's image. Sure. The, the reason is, I mean, if we look at what God is, right, God is fully, I mean, God is full actuality. He is pure being. There is no pot potentiality in him. What that means is God, is, God is free to be who he is. Um, he doesn't require anything else to be. Um, we are made in his image because we, sh although we do have some potentiality, we do have some uh, limitations on our being. After all, we are not gods. Mm -hmm. um, we are made in his image because we share, we, sh we, sh we have this ability to participate in his creative, uh, creative will. And that's something that separates us uh, from animals. Animals are part of his creation, uh, as we are part of his creation. But we are a part of his creation that participates in the act of creation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, you know, and I agree with that. And I think if you're going to argue that that sort of a basis of liberal, liberalism is, it seems very... Uh, if it is based on that high, as the highest value, if liberalism does come from that, I mean, I'd say there's not really all that much we would disagree with. Again, as I said before, that for me, it's more just sort of how it's expressed itself, that the bulk of the classical liberal philosophers have been have not been Christians, but of deists. And wasn't John Stuart Mill an atheist or? John Stuart's Mill, John Stuart Mill's beliefs on religion are very, very hard to parse because, you know, as it was for, for many people at his time, there, there were some statements he, he made where it, it seems like he, it could be taken as evidence that he believed in God. Uh, but then you could say, was that just stuff to get past the censors? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think you sort of have to admit that the bulk of classical liberal philosophers would not, I don't think we could argue, you could say it were, as we would say, orthodox Trinitarian Christians. Um... I mean, it, it does. Awesome. It does certainly. It does certainly vary. I think people like John Adams, or people like John Adams, George Washington, probably much more so than. Uh, well, Thomas Jefferson ab absolutely was not a Trinitarian Christian. He, in fact, defaced the Bible by cutting out all the words that related to the spirit to divinity. 
Yeah, I think I think part of the I think part of the struggle part of the trouble is that a lot of a lot of uh, the early liberal project was kind of rebelling against what they saw as an authoritarian state, and because the church was aligned with the state at that time, and it was in that sense always al aligned with it, um, it was hard for them to imagine a way that the the church could exist in service of liberty and not restricting it in the way that the uh, that the state was at that time. And I think, uh, both particularly for us as Catholics, is this was a this is almost sort of a major stumbling block. Considering that, you know, if the my Puritan ancestors, because I'm a convert, were leaving the Church of England because the Church of England was too Catholic and authoritarian, I mean, this does sort of stem from a massive fear of Catholicism. Uh, new, there was a tremendous amount of anti-Catholicism throughout the 19th century in America, the, this endless fear that the Catholic, that if we let too many Catholics in, they're going to just start taking over the government. And I'm thinking that, you know, in some ways, because Catholicism is so much older than America or even England, the, the modern concept of England post glorious revolution, post um, reformation, that it almost seemed like to me, Catholicism represented something far older and honestly, I think more majestic than anything America or England could ever produce. And <clears throat> because it, it, I'll let you uh, respond to that, but just on the last point is that it almost seems like there's this great fear among a lot of classical liberals uh, and among largely analytic philosophers, this sort of sneering attitude towards anything that can sniff of being from the continent. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's like, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, like I said, I think part of that part of that is kind of historical baggage. I think the an the answer we have to say is is that is that the way liberalism has to be? Is is li liberalism at its nature and um anti-catholic? And I think there are strong arguments for that, but um I think I think there can be a a robust defense of liberalism that um that actually grounds itself in in a catholic uh, foundation, and in mm -hmm. fact, and in fact, that um, by by this robust um, understanding of both liberalism and Catholicism through kind of a um, a personalist understanding of the human being, um, both both Catholicism and liberalism are strengthened. I mean, I think if anybody's going to make that argument, I would say it's well. You're probably one of the best people that I've heard make that, and again, I'm perfectly happy to you know consider myself wrong in certain points. Um, but what, I'm, what was I trying to say is that it's for me is that it's interesting to note that I would say that, you know, if you want to try and I think there's a lot more work than you maybe you think that has to be done to try and blend together or make Catholicism and liberalism more compatible, because what it seems like has happened in America in order for Catholicism to be, palatable to the American sort of post-war consensus is there had to be a lot of, um, you know, sacrificing of its own Catholicism. It's been sort of largely compromised. The sort of, and I, don't, I don't like hating Protestants because I was one for years, but the sort of Protestantization of the Catholic church post Vatican II, where you have things going way overboard, but uh, I think you get what I'm saying, right? Is that it seems in order, in a way for Catholics who have always been sort of on the outside of American mainstream culture to finally get into the mainstream, it sort of required a sacrifice of their own sort of Catholicity or what makes Catholics Catholic. I don't know if, it, I don't know if it was necessary, but it's certainly, it's certainly the way it happened. Uh, would mm -hmm. it have happened another way? I mean, Maybe we can speculate that about that all, all we want. It's just, right. Because I'm just um, looking at the history. Obviously, you can't blame me for looking at the history. That's because I'm a, no, that's not at all. What I do. It's just that I. That's from what I see is that liberalism has really not has made massive. I would say catastrophic mistakes throughout its history. I mean, if if you do want to uh, make a liberalism or do you want to try and change liberalism towards something that is um, far more palatable or far better for the Catholic Church, um, you know. Godspeed to that, but I think it has to contend with the with its past failures to make to at least try and make sure it doesn't happen again. Because you know, as it stands right now, 
the reason why I am not a liberal and would not in, in some ways consider myself as well, not some ways I do consider myself a fairly strong opponent of liberalism is because I think it has done enough damage in history through uh, its political expressions to sort of uh, not, it has lost any trust I would have in it. Uh, something that would uphold a traditional Christian uh, Western society. No, and I, I mean, I think that's a legitimate position to take. Um, you know, one spit, one spit and twice shy. Um, and I mean, that's that is the same same argument a lot of people make for the for the Catholic Church um, that it, you know, because of the harm it's done, uh, they they have lost their trust in it. And mm -hmm. I think, and I think, um, you know, that's something I had to contend to as as I was kind of making that choice as to you know, do I, do I remain Catholic? Um, and for me, what it came down to was kind of the, not just the truth, but kind of the beautiful truth of mm -hmm. the church's teachings. Like the way, the way the church teaches, you know, human nature, natural law, um, it, it really creates a beautiful tapestry, like with, with all the uh, conclusions following from the premises um, in such a way that, you know, I really don't see it anywhere else mm -hmm. and and similarly similarly just in the same way that i i don't i don't excuse but i can forgive the failures of the church throughout its history um be, because i i i see the church as promoting this uh this beautiful tapestry however imperfectly i can do the same uh for liberalism and I, th yeah, and I I can appreciate that, and I think that you know, uh, it's just for me as I think that uh, I would argue that the sort of beauty or the things, the good things that came out of liberal societies, I don't necessarily attribute them. Now, it, you know, I'm not going. To, I don't want to be. I do believe in nuance, unlike it seems everybody else on the internet. Um, you know, does some of the beautiful aspects? Because actually, where I work is essentially I'm interpreting history as it existed in America in the 19th century, sort of the peak of um, the American project as sort of at its most pure, that it, there was a sort of a very beautiful society that existed here. And I think largely, you know, in part, it can be because of liberalism, but I think what's more important is that I think the beauty of the society, you know, the nice, you know, the, and when I say that, I mean like the creation of baseball, the, um, uh, the poetry of Edgar Allan Poe, or uh, the beautiful sort of colonial houses, the you know the little white church, the white wooden Protestant church on a hill. I think that's more a result or a result of deep seated cultural traditions and the Christian faith than it is on the uh, based on the political order at the time, because these things were essentially in America since the beginning. You know. Regard whether or not we were a, an independent country based on a uh, explicitly classical liberal uh, structure, and also is that I think there's so much beautiful aspects of culture for me, obviously uh, that existed in countries that were directly outside of classical liberalism. For me, you know, my favorite historical country is Prussia, and essentially they were. I, I like to make this point that if England based its philosophy on John Locke, Prussia sort of adopted Thomas Hobbes. Uh, in in the you know the, the basic concept that the social contract is society is better off when you have a one central ruler as opposed to anarchy because of all the literal the living hell they went through in the Thirty Years War and I'm thinking you know a beautiful Western culture does not necessarily need classical liberalism to have that same goodness that could exist in America as in you know, a deeply religious, high trust society based around small communities and f the Christian faith, because these things existed outside of American Britain. I think I was just, uh, <laughs> I, I think I've uh, wormed my way around to a point I wanted to make, but I probably told it in a fairly convoluted way. I apologize. No, I, I guess my response is, you know those th those things you mentioned. Um, you know the little white uh, church on a hill. Um, yeah, perhaps you know that's not all liberalism. I don't. I don't think we could say that. I think you could say that. You know, perhaps there is some aspect of liberalism. Um, you know that contributed to that. The idea, 
you know, the idea that people are free to religious, uh, to worship God and, and um, that people should contribute to their society in such a way that we are able to maintain uh, the freedom for all to, to worship God. And, and that's why we have so many beautiful churches oftentimes on the same block. Um, mm -hmm. The well, problem. Well, Go ahead. what? So something else, and I mean, it's kind of a silly example, and you know, some people in the chat might say that that only shows the materialism of liberalism, but I think it does get at something deeper. Uh, one thing I, I thought, one thing that struck me about kind of the beauty of, you know, the classical liberal culture, is I. It, this happened like a week ago, and you know I was kind of at a strip mall, and um, I thought you were about to say strip club. I'm like, what? <laughs> yes, I was at a strip club, and and the strip club uh, shows the beauty of uh, classical liberal culture. No, oh, strip, strip mall, um, and uh, I I was leaving a um, kind of like an Asian bakery, and you know I was eating the food I got at that Asian bakery. And I was walking by a KFC, and I saw a uh, I think I think it was a Korean Korean guy about my age, you know, leaving with fried chicken. And we walked past each other, and you know, there was nothing, you know, that was normal. Um, and I'm not even sure why I I cued into that, why I noticed that, but it was, you know, it it struck me as something like, this is something fundamentally American, and. Mm -hmm. um, the problem I'd say is that it's it's something that is um, I mean if this is like I, I think what you're getting at it, it's not the fact that it's not like commercialism or consumerism I don't think that's what you're talking about or it, it's the ability of people of mass differences to get along but I think this is the problem with multiculturalism is that I think as we are seeing currently right now that Western societies particularly diverse ones like the United States uh, I'd say society right now is starting to break down that the trust between, and you know, there've been multiple studies. I think there's the Putnam effect. People have heard of that, you know, statistically speaking, mul uh, more multicultural so societies have less tr or lower trust than ones that are more homogenous. And I'm thinking, you know, did the, the American project, I think the American project was much more successful, probably likely, you know, what I was talking about when, say, in, in 1830, when virtually everybody in America that was actually free was white, some sort of Anglo-Saxon or Northwest European, and some form of Protestant. But now, you know, especially now when you have a far less, um, when you have a far less religious society like ours, things are breaking down because the sort of um, stronger traditional moral and I think in some ways ethnic, I, I'm not part of the alt-right. I, I, I I will concede that I think that ethnicity does ma does mean something. I just don't think it should be your primary identity. I think it should be faith. Mm -hmm. um, but that when you have when you have a loss of any of you know a variety of sorts of homogenous mm -hmm. concepts, you really can't have a liberal society anymore. Especially when you have let's say with mass Islamic immigration uh, cultures that are just vehemently opposed to these values. And I think it's a problem that a lot of liberals have. I think Crown T before his collapse uh, sort of made this faux pas saying that, you know, uh, yes, Muslims in America are um, no Professor Farnsworth. I'm not part of the alt-right. Uh, he made the point of saying, um, you know, yes, uh, Muslims coming, vast Muslim immigration is leading to the destruction of Western European culture, but in the name of liberal, it wouldn't be very liberal to start deporting or start denying in, you know, mass immigration to Muslims, even though it's demonstrably sh showing that the demographic changes and the influx of pit terrorists is a direct threat to Western civilization. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would certainly agree that um, you can't, I mean, there's a certain there's a certain level where where you distinguish between immigration and invasion, um, mm -hmm. and realistically, um, and realistically, what you're looking at 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 the um, you know the immigration crisis in Europe, I mean, it it 
it looks really a lot like like an invasion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I read a couple news articles and I've I've heard it from relatives living living in Europe um, that I mean you know people talk about families. There are very few families that are actually immigrating. Uh, what you're what you're looking at is like. 20, Unarmed 25 men. year old men, yeah. And I'm thinking just that once again, um, I'm thinking about this on the practical or how this is actually expressed in you know in the real world is I don't know what sort of you know effective response liberalism has to this because I think the only thing that could save Europe or Western civilization from Islam or well, first off, it's I agree with what the distributors said is that maybe I I'm a little more uh, afraid of Islam than he is, but Islam itself is not the primary problem because it's the people that are preventing anything from being done about it, i.e. the progressives. And with both them and the Muslims, I just don't think, at least you know, for decades now, the classical liberals of, uh, across the West have not been able to address this uh, in any real way. Uh, I'm just wondering, how would how does classical li liberalism address mass Islamic immigration if it can still argue that a sort of multicultural society can exist in some way? I mean, I think it fundam fundamentally comes down to human nature. Um, you know, and what I've argued, um, you know, what I've argued is that what liberalism is based upon is that human nature. And similarly, when it comes to Muslim Im immigration, we have to look at, you know, does does Islam in general really represent um, a possible a possible um, successful way of being for human beings? Now, I mean, it, now, go ahead. Now, clearly, there are some there are some who who think that um, uh, that one Imam who's become very popular online. I uh, his name escapes me right now. But uh, Im Imam Taw Tawidi, maybe? Tawadi. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah. He's in Australia, right? I think so, yes. Uh, you know, an, is an Islam like his, yeah, yes, I still consider it a heresy, but, you know, an Islam like his, uh, as the little that I've heard about it, I, you know, it, I see it as much a threat in the same way as I see Lutheranism as a threat. Um, mm -hmm. but the re you know, the reality is that's not the Islam of the majority of, of Muslim people. Uh, yes. and, and I think we in the West don't see that because we, we think of like, you know, Muslim neighbors we have. Um, I worked with a lot of, uh, um, in a restaurant, I worked with a lot of, uh, Muslim kitchen staff, um, a lot, a lot of them being African Americans who became um, Muslim in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what we have to realize is that the Islam that we we kind of see in the West is is not the Islam that was presented in the Quran, and at at least at least from my understanding, and I I, I do have to say that my study of it is very limited. And mm -hmm. it's it's not the Islam that we see um, in Muslim nations that perhaps have the highest um, perhaps have the highest ep epistemic privilege as to what is a real Muslim. I mean, Saudi Arabia, for example. Like, you know, I I, I do see Saudi Arabia's vision of Islam as fundamentally anti-ethical, not just to what it means to be a Western people, but what it means to be a human being. And, and yet uh, the United States is giving it huge amounts of money. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a fundamental problem. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think, I mean, I almost see it as like the United States. It, it, what's interesting is that I, I think, you, you know, whereas I think 10 years ago or back during the, the Iraq war, the left was, you know, all anti-America, burning American flags and all that to protest the war. I almost think, see it now where the left, considering that they have all of the pretty much almost complete control over American society, you know, especially during the Obama administration, they almost, I think they've sort of co-opted it to say, 
the American project is now a progressive project that we're still going to emphasize sort of all the white guilt and all that and show, but that we're progressing, that the American project is now not on classical liberalism and it's now based on, you know, the progressive vision of the future wherein there is no differences between gender, race, class, or anything anymore. Um, and I'm thinking this is especially a problem now because I think even if America certainly was or started out as a nation that was founded upon the classical liberal principles, I don't think it's a nation run on that anymore. I think this is a country that is almost entirely in the hands of the progressives, not would liberals. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and it's why I am, and it, it's almost sort of why I sort of have my own anti-Americanism now, just looking at history. I mean, you could almost start to argue that perhaps it, you know, Democrats are the real racist argument, maybe, that, like, uh, the progressives are the ones you can blame for all the wars, like Woodrow Wilson in World War I, uh, the pr prosecution of the war in World War II by Roosevelt and Truman. But I'd still say um, that, you know, the, anybody that wants to, I'm just going to say this one more time, is that anybody that wants to try to revive or establish a uh, Catholic or I mean, a, a new liberal project has to contend with the fact that the nations that are supposed to be the sort of uh, arbiters or the the OG liberal countries, America and Britain, are no longer liberal nations. Even Sargon himself says Britain's no longer a free country, that you can now be arrested by the state for criticizing Islam in Britain. Sure, but I mean, I think that's a, that's a struggle that both, you know, liberalists and traditionalists share together. Um, you know, traditionalists who want to return to a, a, a kind of traditionalist uh, vision that, you know, whether, whether it's monarchy, whether it's feudalism, whatever, um, you know, they have to contend with the fact that, you know, those, those structures gave way to liberalism, which now gave way to progressivism. And I'm thinking, I mean, my view on uh, liberalism winning is it's not it's ironically for me or the way I see it historically is that uh, liberalism didn't really succeed in the West because it had necessarily the better ideas but because it had the better it had more force it was able to project force more that the reason why Europe did not w become run by you know imperial autocratic Germany is because it and it wasn't because like liberalism was a necessarily better idea it's just it's more because the allies won the war I, now I'm not going to say that you know um, that like a hey, well traditionalism uh, is peaceful and all. I'm saying you know almost every ideology is has to establish itself by force. But it's something that I would sort of wish I, I'm interested in liberals sort of um, responding to the idea that liberalism never really established itself peacefully. Almost always, any nation had to be you know let's take German or France had its own quote unquote liberal revolution and that was a catastrophic failure. Germany was essentially forced into it after it had been brutally, essentially castrated after two world wars. Um, you know, many countries today are just not, you know, Russia is not, it, if Russia was ever going to be liberal, it was going to be the 90s. It's certainly not that now. You even now have, in Poland, a lot of the democratic structures through the courts are being, uh, it's going towards a more autocratic model that it, all across the West, people seem to be rejecting liberalism both from the right and the left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, but I, go ahead. I, think, I think that's something true of every, I mean, of every change in political, political class, if you will, or political structure. There is going, I mean, there is going to be violence accompanying it. You know, the, the only example I can think of uh, off the top of my head, and I'm sure there are more, is... Um, the transition of Italy from a um, from a monarchy to a republic, and the reason for that was that the the king agreed to ab abdicate because he he did not want a civil war, did not want, um, which is fairly know, ironic considering that uh, if you look at the political history of Italy post World War II, they've had like sixty different governments. Yeah, uh, do you know the reason for that? Uh, go ahead, please explain. So it really comes down to kind of the trauma of, of Mussolini, um, you know, and, and we can argue about what you got, we can discuss whether Italy should be traumatized by it, the fact that Mussolini rose to power. But the fact is that the Italian people uh, decided 
decided that they, you know, they never wanted to allow one man to capture the amount of power that Mussolini did. And so what they did was they created a government um, that where power was so distributed among among different branches, so many different checks of power, so many different, um, especially regional checks. So um, it, mm. it it's very federal. Uh, it became it it's became such that yes, no dictator could ever rise to power in Italy. Of course, no functioning government can also rise to power in Italy. Mm -hmm. So. You know that's that's what kind of one of the ironies of life, but yeah, and I'm thinking just because I think this has been a good conversation so far. I uh, it's just that I'm just looking at it is I mean I think it it is obviously if um you do genuinely believe and I do believe you do and have actually at least opposed to a lot of the other people that I've heard that would subscribe to liberalism actually have you it seems like you actually thought about it um. It's it's a struggle that I just don't see. Uh, I'm so, I sort of describe it like the, regardless of its actual truth value in terms of, um, you know, because people like us, like we can actually argue whether or not you know on principles. But as you probably know, for most people, people rely on experience, not on argument. People are swayed by uh, narratives, not arguments, and. Mm -hmm. Like now with uh, Catholicism or Christianity, let's say Catholicism because it is a very physical, um, sensual in terms of the senses, faith that, you know, people, a lot of people are probably not going to be uh, persuaded by the, you know, the basic art, the uh, Aristotelian and Aquinas' arguments for the existence, the existence of God, but they could very well be convinced by Gregorian chant by the beautiful praying of the rosary by beautiful cathedrals. Um, I'm just thinking like, how would that work? How would that translate to, cause I know that's essentially the same way I would do it. Trying to argue for traditionalism, just maybe add some secular aspects to it. Like, you know, non purely religious art uh, and comparing it to honestly, yeah, I'm going to use the alt rights word degenerate stuff we have today. I'm just wondering uh, how do you narratively argue for liberalism? What what can you show people of this is a, this is a clear example of what liberalism as a culture is or a cultural artifact of liberalism? Well, I mean, I guess that's that's part of it. Liberalism isn't a culture. It's you know, it's it's part of what Western culture. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think um, I don't think liberalism. You, I don't think you could be a purely liberal individual. Um, and I think someone mentioned that in the chat, that liberalism needs something else. And that, that's true. Lib liberal is not an identity per se. I, say, I mean, I, I say I'm a liberal, I'm a liberalist because it, you know, people, people get it. Oh, a liberal or liberalist is someone who believes in, you know, believes in the principles of liberalism. But, you know, I'm, Identity-wise, I'm not. I'm not a liberal. I don't. I don't pray to John Locke. I don't. I don't attend. You know, liberal concerts. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't know what a liberal culture would would be. I guess you could argue neoclassical art. You know, you could talk about the art that kind of arose at the same time as mm -hmm. uh, when you know liberalism was uh, forming in in the West. Um, but you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that's true. Um, I'm not sure we could say, yeah, the 18th century is what, you know, what we need to return to. And, and I don't, I wasn't thinking, saying that like, because with art or especially like say with Catholicism where, you know, pe praying the rosary has all, you know, since the middle ages, like people pray the rosary now and pray the rosary centuries ago. But it's more that um, I think that's sort of that would be another problem I would say with a liberal movement is that, you know, I think you're I'm I would say I'm glad that you sort of had this idea that it, you agree that you need liberalism needs something else. Uh, and I would say that that's sort of essentially what church, at least I would argue as traditionalist, reactionary, moralist, maybe. But I would just sort of put the uh, priority differently that. Um, the actual moral emphasis and the moral and traditional culture 
that's what should uh, precede or from that you can have a liberal society or that can create the and even then i would say because i think there's sort of a muddled definition of liberalism in the sense that there's both i would say the and you can disagree with me just let me say this first is um there's the classical liberalism that sort of has sort of a clear definition in terms of as it was developed by the enlightenment thinkers in the 17th and 18th centuries and then proceeded through uh, the 19th with people like John Stuart Mill. But there's also, I suppose, the idea that in the West, one of, you know, what sort of makes the West, what makes us different from, say, the East with uh, China and Japan, Korea, is sort of the logos or this concept, the emphasis on the individual. And I'm thinking that, you know, that doesn't necessarily, at least my view, translate towards individual liberty. For me, it's more sort of self-actualization or almost sort of heroism, like uh, the figure, of, and it's a thing Jordan Peterson talks all the time about how, you know, the Greek, the heroes of Greek mythology or, um, and of course this culminating in the person of the hero, the meta hero, the, the greatest hero being Jesus Christ. And I'd say that, you know, if liberalism is is part of the West, I'd say it's part of a particular part of the West from a particular period of the West, because you know it's not something that was existing that it really existed in Prussia or Austria or Central or Eastern Europe at the time, and you know I you can't really say that Prussia or Germany was not part of the West, even if though if it wasn't even though it wasn't liberal. Oh, I don't consider Prussia and Germany part of the West. You don't consider Germany part of the West. No, no. Uh, as Richard Spencer said, the only the only true white people are Italians, and oh, and gosh. by co <laughs> by co the corollary of that is that Germans, French, and Spanish can't be Ita uh, can't be white. So, well, apparently Ben Franklin <laughs> described he de the way he said he described that like um I don't know what he, what he was doing, but he basically said that like a, it, uh, Germans and Swedes. And now this is before you know multiculturalism uh and i mean cultural enrichment uh germans and swedes were swarthy looking and it's like what? <laughs> <laughs> what but i mean in seriousness is germany is part of the west no i know want... yeah go ahead i'm i'm mostly kidding i do think i do think that the you know for that re for the reason i gave that we cannot consider the french white um so the french are out i'm you know we we can discuss the germans um no, uh, but I would say I would say that if you look at kind of the mythos of the West, um, you know there there is this aspect of freedom, this this you know almost almost the underdog, um, hmm. this kind of uh, rebellion against tyranny. Um, I mean, we see it in you know the Greek stories, the Roman stories. Um, you know, we you know. Uh, why, why, why do we love the, the movie Th Three Hundred as, as much as they love they love the story about about the Three Hundreds at Sparta that defeated the Persians? It's and ironically, itself, um, Sparta was very, very different a very different society from the democracy of Athens. Right, but there was you know there was this idea that you know we are going to stand against you know uh, the Persian Empire. We're not going to be assimilated. We're not going to be um part of we're not going to be part of that i mean the hero the hero we have is socrates it's not thrasymachus um socrates you know became what defined west western thought for so long thrasymachus didn't he you know he's kind of the antithesis the shadow of 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 um did you sort of link stuff about him because i actually i've not heard of him i'm, I'm not a philosophy guy sorry Oh, sorry. Uh, pl uh, in Plato's Republic, uh, two of the main speakers were Socrates and Thrasymachus. Okay. Um, Th Thrasym Thrasymachus argued that uh, justice was the advantage of the stronger. Mm -hmm. But on that, as I'd say that, I mean, uh, um, on that, I just thinking. I'm just thinking. I think it's it's a bit of. A, I can sort of see why, but I think it's sort of a stretch to say that how that really translates to uh, the liberalism of the Enlightenment because, again, if these 
this still concept, if this concept still existed, you know, in areas like Italy, Germany, France, and Spain, which Spain is absolutely not was not capable. I don't think at the time of being a liberal society. Consider up until, I mean, you know what they were doing. What were they doing for hundreds of years throughout the entire Middle Ages was desperately trying to push back the Muslims. You really can't have a a highly individualistic liberal society when you have that, but. And that's why I think that, you know, there's a very good reason why liberalism developed in the area it did in England, you know, arguably the Netherlands and America, because these countries didn't really have to deal with uh, endemic warfare as it did on the continent. The reason why, especially Prussia existed the way it did, why it had to be a incredibly militaristic state is because it had no natural boundaries, no ma natural uh, defensive borders. It was the only way they could do that, that or be completely annihilated. And I'm thinking, you know, when you have to do that, you can't really have a liberal society, which again, I think regardless of its um, philosophical arguments, the way it actually has to work in real life, you know, you can't, I don't think it can work in societies outside of high trust, peaceful, fairly safe countries like England and America. I mean, I think that there's a possibility there. Um, there's a possibility that as much as within Western thought, there is this kind of independent spirit, this spirit for sure. freedom. Yeah. It's, it only, it, it can only manifest itself politically in, um, in either an empire or in a high trust kind of removed, you know, uh, a state, a state that's removed from kind of the chaos of um, borders where, where all the interesting stuff in history happens. But ironic, I just have to put, uh, interject for one moment here is ironically, I think that's where the heroes, the actual living heroes come from is from the conflict. I, uh, you know, that's where you get El Cid uh, from Spain. It's where you get um, where you get uh, oh yeah, Al, you know uh, Saint Alexander Nevsky in Novgorod. Uh, it's where you get um, Frederick the Great. It's where you get Napoleon. It, it's where you get these sort of heroes that you know, real people. Um, and you know, in society, obviously there was heroes in obviously absolutely heroes in England and America. But I'm thinking, you know, having complete isolation doesn't it sort of make turns these things into fairy tales almost. Where and if you don't have to worry about, you know, like the idea today, or it's you know, the idea that like um, I mean, imagine if like you showed the founding fathers the level of government control. And you know, friction of things like the uh, the First Amendment today is they'd have a fit. They'd be like, "Why aren't people rising up against this?" And it's because I think it's largely because we've been fed bread and circuses for so long. We've been sort of safe here. We don't really understand what it means to actually have to struggle for things. And I think, you know, as somebody that's a burgeoning fan of Hegel, I, I really appreciate this concept of the struggle. Like. Um, I'll let you talk, but I, I just wanted to repeat one of my favorite quotes from his is to be, to be free is nothing to become free is everything. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm actually working on a video where I'm, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to be touching on Hegel briefly at, as to how Hegel, Hegel led to Marx led to, um, third wave feminism. Um, hmm. I'd be interested in seeing that because I've been sort of almost trying to defend Hegel or like, cause I kept being told by, you know, that he's like this evil, horrible philosopher that led to everything bad. But it's like, and I started reading him from what I could understand. It doesn't sound that bad. Hegel, Hegel, he Hegel has the, the kind of notorious distinction that, um, you know, someone like Descartes or, or even Immanuel Kant have, which is, their ideas in isolation might not be that bad, uh, but the problem is that historically they were taken in in ways uh, that created mm. created lots of problems later. Um, yeah, the weird thing though being for Marx is that you know 
hit Marx and Engels uh, uh, trying to get uh, Hegelian, the Hegelian dialectic to uh, be purely materialistic as opposed to you read it. It's like, he's literally like talks about spirit constantly, not uh, he, he Hegel is anything but a materialist. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's the whole point. Um, Marx says, yeah, Hegel's right about everything, except he's not talking about like the master and slave dialectic. He's not talking about, um, you know, how to develop a self con like the development of self consciousness. He's he's talking about the you know uh, relationship between the capitalist and the worker. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you can you can certainly see parallels. It's not like Marx was making things up. He he certainly read Hegel. Yeah. Um, would Hegel have appreciated uh, this? application of his thought um we'll never know but i don't think he would have and i think uh, we can start wrapping up um but like it's just sort of like a, if i can just uh, mumble about the future for a moment is thinking that you know if we can sort of agree with or if we can if we agree with hegel if we can agree with hegel you know the idea that ideas will naturally sort of uh, meld together, and then you'll have a synthesis after the thesis and antithesis. I mean, it's sort of something. Um, it's interesting that, like, uh, you know, it's something that I would say liberalism has to go through. That the liberalism of the classical of the Enlightenment, I think, it, it, there needs to be a drastic refer reformation of liberalism if it's going to be able to be applied in the modern world uh, going forward. You know, it has to deal with multiculturalism. It has to answer the massive amount of control owned by the progressives. It has to really, it has to offer something better than the progressives. Because I'm going to say this in my conservatism video, sort of to end with, is that, well, you know, liberalism can offer people the road to happiness. They have to walk it down themselves. The progressives are offering people happiness itself. And I'm just wondering, how, do, how can liberalism ever compete with that? I think I think ultimately what liberalism has to do, and the only liberalism that will be successful, is going to be a liberalism that um, originates from a true understanding of the human being. Um, because ultimately, if we're if we're going to defend liberalism on that ground, that liberalism is you know that the reason why we ought to have political freedom is that we were created free by a God who wants us to be free. Then we must, um, you know, we must we must honor that vision of the human being as, as and his human nature. And, mm -hmm. you know, do, does that, does that entail metaphysical um, commitments? Maybe not for everybody. Um, maybe there are some people who are natural, who are naturally virtuous. Um, but I do think ultimately that that will require some, you know, some vision of a human being that goes beyond the purely material. And I think that's some that's something that all, tr uh, you know, traditionalists, liberalists, all people who are kind of rejecting the paradigm of today. That I mean, that's our enemy. It's it's the it's the materialism. Mm -hmm. And I mean, on that, I think um, despite because it's sort of hard to describe. Again, people have don't really seem to be able to understand that today especially on the internet the idea that you can you, things don't have to be explicitly black and white that i think we'd have we probably have moderate disagreements i would consider our disagreements to be fairly moderate ideologically but ultimately i think a goal or at least um or values are the same and i'm you know in that i'm because i'm very interested in people like you trying to essentially fix liberalism or reform it because in my, I, I say my project or meet people like me in the distributist, it's it's more like trying to establish some new, uh, not just a, an antithesis or a synthesis, you know, with the modern world, but a thesis all on its own. Because what we have to deal with is not, I think one of the biggest problems traditionalists have to deal with is not LARPing, is not saying we just want to go back to, you know, this year before everything bad happened. And I'm thinking, no, we have to deal with the fact that modernity, that say, you know, the past 500 years did happen. And it, it I'm good. I would say it must be done because what's the other option is to let the West and Christendom die. 
But uh, on that final note, do you have anything uh, else to say before we can close? Not much other than thank you very much for having me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Me too. Um, you know, think you know, like you said, I think our our disagreements in many ways are are moderate. Um, you know, it 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 deals it deals with what it what is the relationship between, you know, well, one, what what exactly is human nature? I think we we generally agree, but perhaps we prioritize different aspects of it. Mm -hmm. um, and what is the relationship between human nature and the and the state? Does the state exist to control human nature, or is the state an expression of human nature? Yeah. So um, once again. Uh... If you want to subscribe to, and I highly encourage you to subscribe to Benedict the Seventeenth's channel, I have linked it in the description. Um, hopefully, you can see another episode of my. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to decide whether or not I want it to make it a multi-part video because the script's very long on conservatism. But um, in any case, uh, thank you everybody for watching, and have a good night. Thank you.